Will you stand with us? Fist bump, that's a high five or a fist bump.
Guys, Easter is next week, and I feel that God's going to do something super impacting in our city, in our church, in each and every one of our lives. I promise you, I feel it coming. I'd like to invite y'all to come down and pray for that. Pray for someone that maybe you want to invite to come down. Pray for something that's in your heart. We humble ourselves here at this campus on a pretty frequent basis, and this is that moment. So if y'all want to come down, I don't know if the pillows are out. I think they are. I experienced it for the first time a few weeks ago. I had never come down to the front, and I experienced a very powerful, powerful experience, just humbling myself. If you've never done it, I encourage you to give it a shot. Don't be shy, all right? Lord, we worship you. We ask you to move in our lives, Lord. Lord, we worship you. We ask you to move in this place. Savior gave us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come quickly, your
giving God applause. Lord, we receive all your blessings. Let's make a joyful noise, all right? Oh, I look towards the sun. Oh, alive. 
darkness broken just by your blood. supernatural in each and every one of us right now. In your name I pray and everyone said, Amen. have a seat. Hi, this is Sandrine. This week's announcements are... Give me my glasses. Hi guys, it's Sandrine. Welcome to this week's announcements. Let's get right to it. So we're starting with Strong Foundation Playground. You remember the Strong Foundation is a shelter for homeless families and we've been building a playground there. We're in the final stages and we need your help. So if you're interested in helping out in the lobby, sign up with a volunteer after service. Also, we have a prison ministry and that's a group of people that are reaching out to minister to people inside the prisons and if you are also interested in becoming more involved with that you can sign up in the lobby after service easter we've been talking about it you know all about it sunday march 31st we'll be over at sunset station in the lone star pavilion we've got invitations in the lobby so be sure to grab some of those invite your friends family strangers neighbors everyone you know and encounter invite them to easter sunday food bank you guys, we brought 30 bins from the San Antonio Food Bank. I think I have two left. Awesome. I love that you're doing your own micro food banks. And remember, think outside of your own pantry. Work, school, neighborhood, grocery store, wherever they'll let you collect food, collect food. We're overwhelming the San Antonio Food Bank with 200,000 pounds of food. And let's take a look at a video of how the food bank is affecting lives in San Antonio. Methamphetamine was probably the first hard drug that I ever used, and I've never experienced anything that ever made me feel like, like I was wall to wall and treetop tall, man. I mean, probably what was my biggest downfall was when crack cocaine hit like around 82. I mean, stuff that I normally thought I wouldn't do, taking my kids' Christmas toys and selling them and leaving my son at the park and recreation or in the movies 
and I go get go get cocaine while he's sitting in the movies, and he's like five years old by himself. It's a vicious cycle, you know, and I've been to numerous treatment centers, numerous prisons. I never had a plan to succeed, and I've heard people say, if you don't plan to succeed, then you plan to fail, and that's true. And I remember my son wrote me a letter, and he told me, he says, Daddy, you know, when you get out this time, you have to do something different, and I'm, I'm gonna be there to help you. I kept the application probably about a month. And one day she called me and asked me, hey dad, did you fill out the application for the food bank? And my answer to her was, it's just, it's too many personal questions on there for me to answer. You know, I'm not, I don't know if I want to really answer all those questions. And I really had to accept that everything I put on that application was just who I was, you know, in the past. You know, I prayed about it and I took a chance and filled it out. Two weeks later, I got a call from the executive chef here, David Delgado. He told me, he said, yeah, I see, you know, you got some problems going on with you, but do you think you could come to this program and, 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 and do well in this program if you was accepted? And I told him, yeah, I figured I could, you know. And I really wasn't sure, but I felt like maybe just a little bit that I probably could do this thing, you know. Each graduating class, we award a black jacket to somebody who has gone above and beyond expectations, who has overcome maybe personal experiences in their life to really just soar sometimes beyond what they even think they're capable of. And today, we are very, very honored to present our black jacket to Mr. Bruce Cap. Somebody believed in me and it made me kind of believe in myself. Man never plays God, but I know God often plays man. And I actually believe that he was doing that through the food bank and my daughter, you know, you know, right along with my sons too. I thank God, you know, and I thank the whole, the food bank establishment. And I actually feel like now that I've been raised from the dead, you know, and given a chance, you know, to, to, to do something positive. Lastly, regarding Easter baptisms, if you've been thinking about getting baptized, this is the perfect time to do it. You can sign up in the lobby after service. City Youth, we have City Youth every Wednesday here at the theater. We meet next door in the cafe, 6.30 to 8.30. If you want more information, you can get it in the lobby or you can like our Facebook page, City Youth Downtown. If you want more information or miss any announcements, you can go to our Facebook page, City Church Downtown, or you can visit our website, citychurchdowntown.com. All right, guys, I think that's it. I'll see you next week. Seriously? Hey, oh my. Well, before we get into the Bible to study it today, put your hands out in a posture to receive from God. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me out loud. It's a simple prayer. Don't close your eyes or anything. Keep your eyes open because prayer is just talking to God, right? And just say this out loud. God, I receive from you. I'm open to receive a word. Speak through that knucklehead. If you can speak through a donkey, you can speak through a pastor. I'm open to receive it today, God. Amen. Right on. So we've been in this series. Yeah, thank you. That's kind of you said. So past couple of weeks, Pastor Brent was here. It was great to have him down here talking about marriage and that for a couple of weeks. That was very encouraging to many of us. But prior to that, we were in this five-week series called Word, where we're talking about receiving a word from God, and we needed one more week to finish up and wrap up the Word series. And in case you weren't here, I kind of wanted to go back just for a minute and uh, give those of you that are new a flavor for what we're talking about. So when um, I'm talking about getting a word from God. I don't get like an audible voice from God, right? Um, now, perhaps there are people who do get an audible voice and have gotten an audible voice from God, and certainly people in the Bible did, but I've never gotten that. Um, and you may be wondering, what should I expect? 
Well, sometimes God speaks in very creative and subtle ways. So it's God's grace that he doesn't show up physically and speak in full volume God voice to it because, to us because our physical bodies and um, our taintedness with sin cannot uh, handle the direct presence and voice of God. So it's by his grace that through these subtle and creative ways, he communicates with us and gives us words. Now, um, I want to review a little bit because the overall overarching big idea of this series is that you can get a word from God. Some of you think in ways that you were grown up to think, uh, you know, raised to think that only the pastor or a priest or the pope can get a word from God, but really you can, as a child of God, get a word from God. And in week one of the series, we said that to get a word, you must tune in. The Bible says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You have to be open-minded and have an open heart to receive a word from God. You can shut it off. Week two, to get a word, be sure you're one of his sheep. It's natural for a child of God to get words from God the Father. When you're a sheep, it's natural for you to hear from the good shepherd. Week three, we said we have to test every word that we get from God, right? Because sometimes I just had a thought. It wasn't a word from God. Uh, sometimes whack jobs will come to you and say, I've got a word from God for you. And they don't really have a real word from God for you, it's just they're being whacked, okay? Uh, week four, we said to get a word, just chill, right? You, sometimes we have to be still and listen, be quiet, cut the clutter out of our lives and just sit and be still and receive. In week five, we looked at all the different ways that God speaks to us, certainly through the Bible, his word, and the Bible tells us that we receive words not only from the Bible, but also from the Holy Spirit within us or these heart impressions that we receive as we're under the influence of the Bible. But today, as we wrap up the series, we're going to see that we have to endure every word that we receive from the Lord. Now, the Bible itself is an enduring word. Let me show you this in Isaiah 40, verse 8. That prophet, those many years ago, said, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the what? This is the, by the way, if you're, in case you're new here, when I do that, that's like your cue to participate. Okay, let's try that one again. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord, or the word of our God endures forever. Matthew 24 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus says, my words will never pass away. So certainly there's the enduring word of God, and then when we receive those personal words, we have to endure. So remember, one of our themes this year about the good life is that time plus the next right thing equals the good life. Sometimes we have to endure in the word that we've received to get to the good life. We have to give it time. You can't put your spiritual maturity in a microwave and crank it out in just 30 seconds, you know? We have to give it time. Now, a few years ago, my wife and I went on this trip down to Mexico, and we went snorkeling in these cenotes or these caves, you know? And it was a great adventure, great time snorkeling down there. And I would snorkel down as deep as I could sometimes and scope out the insides of these caverns and caves. And I noticed down in one of the holes down there, there was a rope. And the guy up top explained to me what that was about, that some people who put on diving gear and go spelunk underwater, you know, and, and go through all these tight caverns and spaces, they have a rope there so that they don't get confused and they can follow the rope back out of the cave so they can make sure and survive. And I thought to myself, that's really like the Bible is for us in this confusing, ever-changing, chaotic sometimes world we need the Bible as our rope, the word here, to get us through, uh, to, to, to help us to survive. And the way, part of the way that relates to me is I think about one particular addiction I used to deal with. And I remember many years ago, I got a word, a personal word from the written word of God about that addiction. And the word came uh, from Galatians 6, 9. And it says, and let us not lose heart in doing good, for in do what? Time. We will reap if we do not grow weary. 
Well, did you know that it took 15 years from the time I got this word for me to get free of the addiction that I was dealing with? And so the Bible served as like my rope through the underwater cave to, to keep going, to not give up, to give it time. And in God's timing, 15 years later, I actually got free of that addiction and have been free for many years now. Now, uh, when I think about enduring, um, I automatically think about this book I read called Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. And it's about the Mount Everest adventure that went south due to a blizzard back in the 90s. Some of you know that Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on the earth at 29,028 feet. And in April of 1996, a group of adventurers went to summit Everest. They endured oxygen depletion, frostbite, hypothermia. They were led by one of the greatest climbers in the world. His name was Rob Hall. One of the team members was a guy named Doug Hansen, who was a postal worker from the Bay Area who had held down two jobs to save up the $65,000 that it took to go on that expedition. Another team member was Yosako Nombo, who was a 47-year-old woman who would be the oldest to summit Everest. Um, eight people were on the team total. Five reached the top, and four died in the storm that blew in below them as they were high up on the mountain. Now, I'm going to refer back to their story throughout my talk, so uh, save it for now, but let's change channels just for a minute to church. I've been with our church here downtown since we started the downtown and at Bandera Road at that campus. Back when we started, I was on the team that started, and I've been watching church people over the years. I've been watching unchurched people who come into church and become church people, and I've watched more go than stay. Most don't endure. I could go back somewhere in a file at church and find stacks of cards. You know, sometimes we have these services where you like fill out a commitment and you like sign your name on that and make a commitment to follow God and do these great things for God because you received a word or got real excited in a particular church service. More people bail out than continue trekking up the mountain. On TV preacher stuff, sometimes it works that the God fairy comes and taps you and everything gets better in your life. But in reality, when you start getting on the God mountain and following Jesus Christ, your life can get jacked up and it gets harder sometimes. Right? So those of you that have done this know this to be true. I want to give you some encouragement from 2 Timothy. This was written to believers who were being killed and persecuted for their faith. 2 Timothy 2.11, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we what? Endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. But here's the good part. If we're faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. So certainly we want to endure because there are rewards, spiritual rewards at stake in the afterlife. But if we're faithless, it's a good thing that he, he will not bail out on us if we um, have struggles and, and can't keep going and deny. Because see, when you truly come to know Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. And when God sees you, he can't deny himself. He loves us, right? Unconditionally, he endures whether we do or not. But today, I want to show you four truths about enduring because I know in your heart you want to endure. You don't want to be one of those that falls away and gives up and doesn't keep trekking up the mountain. So look at number one, to endure, humble yourself to receive help. Now, guys, I need to talk to you, a lot of you, about this. Because a lot of you, you're like me. And it's like, dude, I've got an iPhone. I don't need anybody's help, right? <laughs> I mean, I use my GPS, I can get whatever I need to go. I'm not going to ask for directions. I can handle it, right? Um, I can deal with my life, and I don't need the help of other people. But some of us have to come to this place where we say, no, I, I'm gonna, it takes some humility on my part to admit to other people that I need help from others. You never make it up the mountain without help. Look at Ecclesiastes um, 4, 9, and 10. Two people are better than one. For they help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. 
So we've provided all kinds of small groups and Bible studies and stuff to, to help you. You can look on our website and see those prayer leaders after the service to help you humble yourself to receive help. Don't ever get on the mountain to seek after God by yourself. But look at number two. You're most susceptible to quit when you're ashamed. When you're ashamed. Now, shame in our lives when we've sinned or struggled or made mistakes, whatever, Shame is like an anaconda that wraps around our feet and uh, starts squeezing the will to, to keep walking out of us, doesn't it? Have you ever felt that? It's like, why should I even get back up? Why should I even keep trying? Because I keep failing. I keep screwing up. And you're losing the will to live, to keep seeking after God. That's why it's been so important for us in our church to create an environment of grace. The only way to fight the shame snake is with grace and mercy and uh, acceptance and love, right? So we have to continue to walk in grace and extend grace and radical acceptance to other people who are struggling. And some of you are on the verge right now because you've struggled and I want to encourage you to get up. Jesus gave us encouragement in a story in the Bible where there was a guy that had some, some company over and he needed some extra bread to feed his company. So what he did, the guy walks to his next door neighbor's house and he knocks on the door and he's yelling at the guy inside saying, hey, I need some extra bread because I've got company over here. And the guy inside's like, hey, man, it's late at night and I've already put the kids to bed. You know what an act of Congress it is to get the kids to lie down and actually be still. I'm not giving you any bread. Leave me alone. But the guy kept on knocking, kept on bugging him. And look at what Jesus said about this in Luke 11:8. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he'll get up and give you whatever you need because of your what? Shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. We've got to take shame out of the equation through grace. Keep getting back up. Do not let the shame keep you down. There are some of you that are volunteers in the church. Uh, you lead things in the church. You volunteer and serve in the church because at one point you received a heart prompting or a word to engage in serving. Others of you are community catalysts out in our city serving and loving people and you're discouraged. I want to encourage you to get back up and keep asking, seeking, and knocking. Some of you who are spiritual investigators, something happened in you that made you want to keep coming here and checking into this and seeking after God. The Bible teaches us that if we will continue to seek him with all of our hearts, he can be found. So I want to encourage you to keep seeking and looking for him. Endure in that journey. Now look at number three. And here's one I don't like. A word from God may require some risk. I don't like that. Okay, God makes me very uncomfortable sometimes. And in risk, there's a lot of uncertainty in there. What we want to do is we always want to see what God's going to do. Then we'll step into it, right? But the way of the Bible and the way of faith is first we step, then we see, right? We have to step, then we see. And that's a little bit scary. It's a little bit discombobulating, isn't it? So um, th this is the way it works in me a lot of times. I'll get this word from God, and I'm so bold up front, right? Word from God. I'm bold about it. I've got a word from God. But then when the word doesn't get fulfilled in my life, I get less confident. So I'm like, well, I, I might have got a word <laughs> from God. I'm not quite as bold. And then I go from that to uh, I may have just had a thought that I thought was about God. <laughs> you know, it, it continues to get less bold um, throughout the process when I don't see it fulfilled. And can you imagine Noah? He got a word from God to build this huge wooden boat, the big ark, and he was probably being teased by his neighbors. Can you picture the neighbors like, hey, Noah, are you going to let termites on the boat? You know, and I was like, that's funny, man. I mean, a couple of, you know, it's like wood. 
termites, you know, a couple of... I enjoyed that one if nobody else did. But it's like, Abraham, um, he was called, he got, he got a word to go out to a place he didn't know and like start a whole nation. And it was scary to leave where he was safe to go and start this new thing. So faith kind of keeps the adventure in our lives. And I got to ask you, is your idea of adventure like sitting on the couch and watching an adventure on Netflix or uh, watching an adventure on just a video game? Nothing wrong with Netflix or video games, but um, I know that, that sometimes in our culture we are over concerned about risk. On everything you see, there's a warning label, isn't there? Like I, I saw on this microwave oven the other day, it says, do not use for drying pets, warning. Hello. <laughs> Honey, the poodle, I just put the poodle in there for a minute, you know, and it dried her right up, right? Um, but I thought to myself, wouldn't it, I should have Sandrine put like a, a warning label on church, like outside the church, warning, if you go into that church and get a word from God, it might jack up your whole life and your whole financial portfolio, you know, because God will require a lot of you. Time Magazine had an article where it said that 79% of Americans have done nothing adventurous in the past five years, and that's called the vanilla syndrome. You know, it's kind of like going to Baskin Robbins where there's 31 flavors. Technically, it's 57 flavors. I kind of looked into it, but you have all those flavors, and if you just get vanilla, dude, that's a sin, man. You shouldn't get vanilla when... <laughs> You have all those options, right? But a lot of us settle for like vanilla lives when God wants to give us this life of adventure and a life of faith. Dr. Glenn Williams, the director of the Maryland Psychological Research Center said, man was not created to be safe. If there is no risk or danger in his life, he will create it somehow. <laughs> That's why people will like, ride roller coasters and go bungee jumping and go skydiving and buy Harleys and that. We were made for adventure and we create adventure if we don't get it. That's why the, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 when it comes to risk and faith, it's impossible to please God without faith and, and there's risk in that. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So within the mountain climb of faith, we have to risk sometimes. And I, when I thought about this, I always think about, you know, this ride that I did some years ago. I told you guys this story a couple of years ago, but for those of you who are new, I wanted to tell you this story because it's really fun for me to tell. And it's like, I, I've done skydiving, bungee jumping, all that. But for me, one of the funnest adventure things like that is this thing called the Screaming Sky Coaster that they used to have at Fiesta, Texas. Some of you guys remember that? They used to crank you up there on that deal. They sent, sold this ride to the Texas State Fair, so uh, I wish they would bring it back because I really love the ride, but I got to ride it all the time. I would do it over and over and over again, so I knew how to make it the best experience, and I always wanted to be the guy um, out of the threesome in the, the harness who would hold the rip cord, because if you hold the rip cord, then you can decide when you're going to pull and fall and all that. Now, when you get up there, it's like 180 feet tall. They crank you up 180 feet. And you pull two and a half Gs when you do this thing. So it's really exciting. And the way that it works is that the guy below is on this megaphone, right? And he says, one, two, three, fly. And when he says fly, you're supposed to pull the cord and then you start to free fall for a while and then you swing uh, back and forth. So they crank us up there. And since I was a youth pastor at that time when I was doing this, um, I had these two teenagers with me and I wanted them to have a really good experience. Okay. I wanted it to be really fun uh, for them. And when we get cranked up there to the top at 180 feet, I would swear I could see Mexico from there. I mean, it is way <laughs> up there. And we get up there, and the guy starts the countdown. And I've got uh, this teenager, Bryce, on one side, and then uh, I have Heather uh, next to me. And, and the guy says, one. And on one, I pulled the cord, and I said, oh, my goodness, something's gone wrong. And we start to fall. It's like, ah. And then you get to a point where you can't even yell. It's like, ah, 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 ah. 
We got out of the harness, and Heather was like, what are you doing? Hit me. I almost lost my glasses on that one, dude. It's like, it's like still have scars from her Lee press on nails, you know, even to this day. Because, see, I didn't want him to have a lame experience. And God's like that, man. He does that to me. He scares me to death sometimes when I follow him in faith. We know that the fruit's out on a limb, isn't it? And sometimes to experience God's fruit, we have to get out on that limb in faith. But look at number four, to endure, get a mental picture of your motivation. A mental picture of your motivation. Now, I want to take you back to Everest for just a minute. Uh, Beck Weathers was on the team. He was a Texan, okay, from the Dallas area. And while on the mountain, he was reported dead. He was found with three inches of ice on his face, still barely alive, and his right glove was gone, which you know what that means, right? So he was as close to death as possible, and he was left for dead by others who left to save their own lives. But that morning at 4.30 a.m., as the rest of the group that was still alive were in their tents, they saw this shadowy almost figure walking along, walking through that blizzard, missing a glove. They knew that it was Beck, so they got up immediately and got him into a tent and tended for him, not knowing how he made it to that point. They thought he was surely going to die. They tended to him, took care of him, but that night the blizzard got even worse and it shredded his tent he should have died again. Others left him again for dead, but he kept getting back up. Keep, he kept taking one step at a time to get off that mountain. He lost some things. He um, had his right arm, left hand, and fingers and nose amputated. I brought a picture of Beck after the experience. Don't look if you get grossed out and stuff. He reconstructed his ear from skin from his forehead. And when I think about all he endured to get off that mountain, I wondered what would motivate a man to get up in the midst of knowing you're going to lose your hand, um, being barely alive. And what Beckweather said that motivated him was that he could see his family. He could see his wife and his kids. He could almost literally see them right in front of him. And that was the mental picture that gave him the motivation to stand up and take more steps. And I thought to myself, you know, sometimes when I'm not motivated to keep going, I think about my relatives that are on the other side that have died that I can rejoin in heaven someday. I'll get to see my mama again. And with that, I take encouragement to fulfill Galatians 6, 9. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we'll reap if we do not grow weary. Beck Weathers was left with scars from the mountain. And so are you and I sometimes when we follow in the steps of faith. But the word I've had to endure in recent days is a word related to the city. Now, some of you know you've heard my talks. You've heard me give these talks for several years downtown here that is a little over five years ago that I got a word about the city and about serving the city and loving the city. And I'd look at the Old Testament book of Isaiah and it's like some people call Isaiah the prophet of the city, right? He constantly talks about urban realities and loving and serving uh, your city. And then I would come to the New Testament and I would see Jesus looking over his city, Jerusalem, and he wept for his city because it was like sheep without a shepherd. And then Paul um, was, was afraid to go in this one city, but uh, the Holy Spirit said to him, I have many people in this city, so don't be afraid to have many people in this city. And I couldn't get the inner city out of my head. So we started an inner city church presence here um, almost five years ago now. So what was the word I received those years ago about? It's not hard, city, the city. Um, so 
we started this church downtown here, and I realized my wife and I are talking about we can't minister from a distance. I mean, we were driving from 28 miles away, way out to come down here. And, and, you know, some are supposed to drive down, but others, like, we felt like we were supposed to live down here in the city. So we put our house on the market, and we thought to ourselves, man, if God's given us a word about the city, then he's just going to have all these offers coming in. And you know what? Nobody wanted to buy our house. And it was kind of discouraging. Because, you know, when you have your house on the market, you have to, like, keep it clean and stuff. Well, I wanted to, like, rename our kids Tornado Number 1 and Tornado Number 2, right? We'd clean it up, and they're just, like, going through there like the Tasmanian devil, right? Just tearing everything up. So we put it on the market, left it on the market for a while, kept trying to keep it clean. Someone would want a showing. They would come in. We had to clean it up and get out of our house and all that. And we went on for a long time, and I could see that we were all getting tired from trying to keep it clean. And so we took it off the market to take a break. Where's my word, God? We put it back on the market, and we thought, maybe it's going to be this time, right? So we put it back on the market. We kept it clean, you know, um, had those showings and everything, kids tearing it up, cleaning up right behind them, you know. Um, and still, no one buys our house. I went from, I've got a word, to I might have a word. <laughs> so we were pretty discouraged. We had it on the market, I think, like three different times over all those years, praying God. And I remember I was very discouraged in November, just this past November, I was real discouraged. And I was talking to a good friend of mine over the phone, and I'm telling him, hey, man, you know, maybe I'm not getting something right. And, um, you know, and he encouraged me, and he corrected me, actually. He said, Doug, you're not doing anything wrong. He said, God, it's just not God's timing for you to move downtown, and God has something better than what you were thinking. And then he did something that really made me mad. He quoted from, from one of my own sermons about how I was defaulting back to law rather than receiving God's grace. And I hate it when people do that. You know, I just teach you this stuff. I don't have to do this stuff, right? <laughs> but he was right. And that day, um, I took a different route to get back to the highway. And you ever do that? You just take a different route for fun? And I drove through this neighborhood that was kind of close by here, and I saw this house that was for sale. And I thought, that's kind of cool. So I stopped, and I'm not the type of person that waits for a realtor or anything. I just went up to the door. I knocked on the door, and this guy comes to the door. I'm like, hey, I noticed your house is for sale, and um, can I just walk around the backyard? I don't have to come in. I don't have my realtor or anything. He's like, no, dude, come on in. So I walked in. I just walked through the house, and I thought, this really works. I mean, this would be a great floor plan for um, our family, you know, and, and it would really work. And I thought, this is great. So I went home and I told my wife about it. And we got online and looked at the pictures, you know, online and all that and uh, it looked great. And so we call our realtor up and we say, let's go look at this house. And so she takes us into this house and we look through the house. My wife just loves it and it fits just perfect. It's really um, a, a great place for us. And so what we decide to do we're going to put our house on the market one more time because we can't afford to just buy, you know, and keep two, two house payments and all that. So we have to sell our house out in the suburbs before we can move into the house in the city. And so uh, our, we, go, uh, we get a contingency offer on the table with our realtor. We offer them uh, to buy the house um, contingent upon the sale of our house. Well, they didn't take that. And then a few days later, someone else got a contract on the house. And so we didn't get it. You know how that felt, right? There was a Hebrew word for that. Sucky. <laughs> so we were bummed, <laughs> defeated. Um, meanwhile, though, we had, we had put our house back on the market out in the suburbs. And after two weeks, there were like two families in a bidding war over our house out there. And we got full asking price for it and sold it. Thank God because that was one hurdle to get over in that journey. Um, so we're with our realtor, we're downtown here looking for houses and we couldn't find anything that seemed to work. And it was really discouraging. But we had this one friend who we really trust and she's, you know, uh, she's not a whack job or anything. And she gives us this word. She says, I believe the Lord's saying, go over to that house she really wanted and anoint it with oil and pray and ask God for it. 
Honestly, I kind of rolled my eyes internally. I thought, yeah, right, whatever, you know. So we were eating lunch downtown, and I'm talking to my wife over the table, and I said, hey, you know, Jeannie, what have we got to lose? Because doesn't the Bible say sometimes you got to receive help or ask for help? So we went over to the Walgreens, and I let the Walgreens right over here downtown. And my wife went in to get some oil, and there was one bottle of cooking oil left on the shelf. I guess they were out of house anointing oil, so she had to go with the uh, cooking oil. So she buys the last one off the shelf, and we go over to this house that actually someone else already had under contract. And I didn't really know how to anoint a house, right? So I go up in the yard, and I'm just like, you know. <laughs> My kids are making fun of me, right? They're like, you're trespassing. You know, all this, <laughs> shut up, you little freaks. <laughs> so I take some of that oil out of that cooking oil and just like remember in the Bible how they would anoint stuff, you know, and so I put some um, on the doorpost and um, the door frame and I prayed and I said, God, I pray that you would bless the people that own this house and bless the people that have it under contract and bring your kingdom here. And if you would want us to live in this house, we would gladly receive it. So kids still making fun of me. We get back in the car. Jeannie and I both prayed over the house. And literally, we were in the car. While we were still in the car leaving, get a call from my realtor right after we prayed. And she says, Doug, you're not going to believe this, but the people that had that house under contract just backed out and I put up a backup offer for you so you now, have that, you now have that house under contract. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> whoa. Yeah. So Jeannie started crying, you know, and she hugged me, and I've got to admit, I maybe leaked a little bit of, <laughs> out of my eyes. And, um, and my son said, you know, I have to admit, I've just seen a miracle. That's worth something, right? So just this past week, we closed on our house down here in the city. And remember the word that God gave me was what? Well, let me show you what street we're going to live on. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm going to be a pastor at City Church living on City Street. And that's just what one friend calls God showing off, isn't it? I wish all that would have happened in a short time frame, but some words that you receive must be endured. You have to endure through to see the word fulfilled. And you know why it's so important for us to obey those words that we've been given from God? It's important because the stakes are so high in what we're doing here at church. I want to take you back to Everest for just a minute to make this point. John Krakauer writes that at 21,000 feet, he and the team came across a dead human body. And at 21,300 feet, they ran across another body. It's so high up, they can't carry the dead bodies up the mountain for people who don't make it. And he says, it was as if there was an unspoken agreement on the mountain to pretend that the desiccated remains weren't real as if none of us dared to acknowledge what was at stake here. If you're going to climb Everest, your life is at stake. Human lives are at stake. And I want to tell you something. And what we're doing here at church, it's not just human lives. Some people will be helped by recovery and spiritual growth and the grace of God so that they won't commit suicide and they'll literally live. But more than that, human souls in eternity will be saved for eternity because of what we're doing here. And that is why it's so important that we obey words that we've received from God. Let me show you this in 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25. As the scriptures say, people... We're just like grass. 
Their body is like a flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. Look, these physical bodies will fade. I don't care how healthy you are. I don't care how good a shape you're in. I don't care how smart you are. You and I are going to fade and wither and die. But look, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. The good news is simply this, that Jesus Christ died on the cross to take the punishment for my sins and for yours. And no matter who you are, what you've done, if you would stand before Jesus Christ in prayer and simply believe that he died on that cross for your sin, you can have a relationship with God. So with that in mind, let's bow for prayer. And perhaps you, in your own heart and mind right now, would like to begin a relationship with God, something stirring in your heart. You're receiving what I call that first word. And if you would like to begin a relationship with God, just pray in your own heart between you and God. God, I know I've sinned. And right now, the best I know how, I choose to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. And God, I welcome you into my life. Father, I want to thank you for those who just received their first word and began a relationship with you. As we continue in prayer, perhaps there are others. You've received a word, all right. You've started the journey, all right but you're tired or perhaps you're discouraged or maybe you feel held down by some shame that you've experienced due to some sins and mistakes. If that's anybody, just peek up at me real quick. Anybody feel a little discouraged? Yeah. Yeah. Ready to quit. Yeah. I get that one. I've been there on that one. Let me pray. I want you to pray this. Pray in your own heart, God, the best I know how. Just like that guy Beck Weathers on that mountain, I'm going to get up and keep walking. I'm just going to put one foot in front of the other. I'm just going to take the next step. I'm just going to do the next right thing, God, because I want to endure. Give me the grace and the strength that I need to endure this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as we wrap up today, um, if you should need prayer with one of our prayer leaders at the front, they'll be available for you. Also, I want to remind you about Easter. Um, if you sometimes go to the 1 o'clock service, don't come at 1 o'clock next week, okay? Because we only have the 10 and the 11.30. Since we have such a large space for Easter, we've got invites out there. You can invite friends. It's going to be amazing music. Uh, our own Linwood King uh, from the band The Heroine is going to be there playing along with the West Side Horns. And then there's going to be uh, the vibey sounds of Jai Roots and Jesse and... We're going to baptize people. Dude, I'm going to like power dunk people. I cannot wait to baptize some of you people. There are like over 60 people signed up to be baptized. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to pound the food bank with food. I hope we go well over our 200,000 pounds of food. So it's going to be fantastic. Sunset Station is just right over here in the same neighborhood. Not hard at all. Come on down. Invite loads of people. It's going to be fantastic. They've only given me 10 minutes for my talk, okay? Some of you are like... Praise God, you know, um, but I'm going to try and condense it, you know, and, and, and get the point uh, across there. So anyway, the last thing I want to remind you guys about is giving, worship through giving. Um, the way that we fund the ministry here is through your generosity. And some people practice this ancient discipline called the tithe, which means a tenth, a percentage tenth of their income. And I wanted to show you a place in the Bible real quick before we take off where Jesus actually confronted these overly uptight religious guys in Luke eleven forty two, He said, what sorrow awaits you, Pharisees? For you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore justice and the love of God. Look what Jesus says there. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. And so 
what Jesus is saying to these guys is, you guys give to your house of worship the tithe. And you know what? You should do that. That's great. But don't neglect the poor, the broken, the oppressed, and social justice issues. And so what we've said here is that rather than having an either-or mentality in our giving, I'm either going to give to my house of worship or to the poor. We say it's giving like the genius of the and, right? It's this and this. It's church and the poor. And you know what we've kind of tried to do around here? Since our church is so much about the poor, we kind of double dip. And if I give to the poor over here and the church over here, I'm still giving to the poor through the church a lot, right? Because we care about the, the justice issues that matter to God. So let's stand up and pray for our offering um, before we go. And just practically speaking, those of you that are new, we have an offering envelope in your seat that you can use as a giving tool. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering box in the back. We also have a giving kiosk for those of you who like to give electronically, and then others give online at citychurchdowntown.com. Let's pray for um, our offering. God, I want to pray for our people. I want to thank you for them, all the good and amazing things that you're doing in our lives in this church. And so I want to pray for these offerings, that you would use it and provide for every need that you want to fill out there certainly the things that we're doing in the church to help people come to Christ and get recovery and help the poor and all of that. And I want to pray for our people as they give generously. I pray you bless them. Bless their businesses, their finances, provide for them in creative ways where they know you're real and you're looking out for them and taking care of them. Thank you for the ways you've blessed us. And God, we want to go from this place as a group of people who don't just hear words, but endure every word. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You guys have a great Sunday and we'll see you on Easter.